three, two, one. Here we go! Well, Kenna, I am actually very excited to do this with you. Uh, like I was telling you on the phone, you are a very special, unique, and gifted person. And uh, I've worked with so many people since I've started and in my life, and you are one of the most unique and special uh, person that I've uh, worked with and I've been friends with. Uh, and uh, So nice. No, but I, I really mean it. And, and this podcast is uh, a way to celebrate you, uh, but also a way for other people, uh, and specifically women too, uh, that many times they don't feel like they're good enough. And, and they look at, at a woman that is charismatic and successful like you, and, and they look at that and it's like, well, that's not me, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and there's possible we can, we can talk about you that uh, is not just like that, that being kin is just an easy thing and everything just works out. Uh, there's, there is a, a lot behind that, and that you are a human, and you're a human that has dealt with hard things, uh, and, but you fought those things, and, mm -hmm. and you've accomplished amazing things with sweat and tears, right? Yeah, uh, a lot of sweat, a lot yeah. of tears. <laughs> because it, it's, I mean, we, we, whenever I see you, whenever everybody sees you, it's like this happy, loud, cheerful person, <laughs> right? Uh, but it's not like that 24-7. It's 23-7. No. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, Kenna, uh, let's, a little intro of you. Tell me uh, where you're from, where were you born, where were you raised? Let's, mm -hmm. let's go from there. Yeah, so I was born in America Fork, Utah, also raised in like Highland Alpine area. So just local. My parents are both from Hawaii though. So they they moved to Utah for to go to BYU and then they got married and stayed here. But I wish I was born in Hawaii, that would have been awesome. Um, but we did get to go back every summer. So we got, went and like lived with my grandparents for a month every summer, which was fun. So I got to live, I say live in Hawaii, but it wasn't really living. Um, and I think that was all the questions you asked me. Yeah, well, and, and, and when we talk about your, uh, your, your background and, and your parents, we think Hawaii is like, oh yeah, they were like Hawaiians, happy people, but there's a story behind why they, they, they got to Hawaii and, uh, and everything. So tell me a little bit about your parents. What's their background? My parents' background? Well, so I'm, Fifth generation Japanese. So my great grandparents came as kids. Well, obviously all of their stories are a little bit different, but from Japan, Okinawa mostly, and like the southern part of Japan, um, Fukuoka area, which is also where I served my mission. So that was cool. Okay. Um, but they've been in Hawaii their whole lives. My both of their parents, my dad wasn't a member of the church growing up, but he was a, he went to Samoa as a foreign exchange student and converted there. And then my mom grew up a member of the church. My grandpa joined the church. He went to BYU Hawaii. So that, I mean, I feel like the church has been one of the biggest influences on my life growing up. So your dad was not a member? My dad was a member. He's a oh. convert. In Samoa. How random is I that? I know. Super random. The missionaries, his, um, his host family were members and they said on Sunday, the first Sunday he was there, he was like, they said, okay, we're going to go to church. He's like, no, I don't, I don't do the church thing. I'm a Catholic. And so they dropped him off at the Samoan Catholic church and he didn't understand a word. So the next week he was like, okay, okay, I'll come with you. And then from there he just met the missionaries and then wow. that's how he's baptized Okay. eventually. And then my mom grew up a member. And then they moved, uh, they went to be with Hawaii or. So my both my parents went to BYU, Provo. Provo. Okay. Yep. Um, and that's where they met. That's where they met. Oh, so my wow. mom went on a mission early because her dad was a mission president in Japan for a little while. Oh, wow. Um, so she went when she was 19, when girls could only go at 21. We have like royalty here. <laughs> and then um, my dad went to BYU for a couple of years. And then he was really influenced by his roommates and things like that. And then eventually he decided to go on a mission too. So he was a little older when he went on a mission. And then... Where did he go? He went to Japan also. Okay. Yeah. So my mom, my dad, 
all went on missions to Japan, me too, which was so happy. And my sister too. Now we're just waiting for the rest of my siblings. Um, but then, yeah, they both taught at the MTC. My mom was dating someone. Oh, uh, it, it was an overlap. So my dad was was working there. I don't know how much detail you want. Um. <laughs> so much detail. Anyways, my dad was working. My mom met my dad. They were at a party together. My mom was dating someone else, but then she broke up with him. Anyways, they got together and now they're married and stayed in Utah. So, okay. So yeah. they got married to BYU, working MTC. And how many siblings do you have? So I have three siblings. I'm the oldest of four. Okay. So it's me and then a sister and a brother and a sister. So three girls and a boy. Okay. And what was it like uh, growing up in that family? Um, I loved it. My family was super close. Actually, when we were really young, we used to fight all the time. But as we've grown up, we are just like the best of friends. We shared a room, so we'd fight. But then at, at the end of every night, even after, after we had huge fights, um, we'd talk for hours and hours and hours. And my parents were always like, go to bed go to bed, stop talking to each other. But we just like loved each other so much that we just kept talking about So super close with the time. family. Until the somebody fell asleep. Yeah. And then, yeah, the rest of my siblings, it's just, it's so fun. Now we're all so close. Hmm. And uh, with your parents, uh, what what were your parents like? Uh, your mom, uh, I know your dad is in business. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he does very well in, in, in what he's doing. What? How was it? How are your parents? Uh, as parents for you? I love, I love my parents. Um, and I think they were given to me for a very specific reason. Um, my mom and my dad are like complete opposite. So I'm very like my dad, like super business minded, um, really ambitious. Um, he's just like always pushing himself to do like the next thing and is like, gets pretty obsessive about what he does. So he's really successful at what he does. Um, and my mom, she's just super soft-spoken, so kind, just the like a, the definition of a peacemaker in our home because you have a lot of strong personalities that you're living with. And she was always the mediator between all of us. So I'm grateful for both of my parents and how they raised me because my mom gave me a lot of freedom and in, in – how she let me live my life. She like respected my agency always. Um, she trusted me. My dad trusted me too, but he was, my dad was strict. And my dad really pushed me and expected the best of me all the time. Whereas my mom was really soft. She expected the best too, but um, just in very different ways. Yeah. And so I'm really grateful for both of them because I feel like I got to pull things from both of them that make me me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh when growing up, uh, where, when did you start uh, kind of seeing the influence on your parents that you became more like your dad or your mom? Uh, when did that happen? Yeah, well, when I was young, actually, me and my dad would butt heads a lot because I we were imagine. so similar. Yeah. Strong personalities in the same room together all the time with different opinions. <laughs> Doesn't always go down well, but um, so I always – wanted to be like my mom because I saw how she brought so much peace to her house. Um, and I really liked how she respected my agency and she always trusted me to do, to be the best, even if she wasn't like on my back about it all the time. But um, I realized probably like in college that I'm very like my dad in the sense that like once I hook onto something and I decide that I'm gonna do it, like there's nothing that can stop me from doing it. And so, I don't know, I feel like I have both and I I talk about my dad like, <laughs> he's like scary, but my dad's awesome. He's like super people person, like loves to be around people all the time. So I feel like that's like my dad too. My mom's a little more introverted than my, my dad. So I think I really do take so many things from both of them. Yeah. And when you were a teenager, when you were like 12, 15, what did you want to do with your life? What was your, your game plan and, and, and like hobbies, like what, what, who was Kenna back then? When I was like 12, I wanted to be an orthodontist. I was obsessed with teeth. So that was like a super random thing. But then I shadowed in an orthodontist office and I was like, this is super boring. So then I was like, okay, well I need to find something else. I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't like have 
something that I was like, I'm going to be this. But I had phases in my life where I was like, I want to do this. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I think I'm going to do this. I guess I'll just like do this thing until it's not a thing anymore. So all throughout high school, I danced. I wanted to be on the Cougarettes for BYU. It's BYU's dance team. And so that was like my identity in high school. Huh. Is like, I am a dancer. This is what I do. I'm going to go super hard at this. And I've heard you were... Very good at it. Uh, I've heard it from multiple people. Yeah, I was committed. I could have. I mean, I could have always been better. But yeah, I mean, I put a lot of time. I put a lot of effort into being a good dancer because I'd done that my whole life. I started when I was like three. Really? Wow. Yeah. I mean, not like super intense. It was like little girl dance classes, right? But yeah, I started that when I was super young, and then I just did it my whole life. And then from like high school, from sophomore year to senior year. I joined like a pre-professional competition team. And so that's when I got super intense about dance. And then I was trying to be on Cougarettes um, in college. But there wasn't anything that I really wanted to be like professionally. Yeah. I didn't know. I just had no clue. I was like, well, we'll see where life takes me. Well, and and dancing, I mean, in Utah is extremely competitive. Yeah, it's and cool. then when you talk Cougarette and you talk with all the things, that is just the highest, highest level. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you navigate that, uh, that that pressure of perfectionism, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and something that you actually also love. Right? Yeah. Well, I did love dance. I didn't always love dance. I kind of went through phases in my life too where I was like, oh, I love this. Oh, okay, I don't want to do this. Oh, I love this. Oh, I don't want to do this. But it, I, it always came back to like, I really want to just like dedicate myself to something. Um. And I just thought it was always interesting, like how the body moves and th things like that. But how I dealt with like the perfectionism, yeah, because you're like looking at yourself in a mirror 24-7 all the time, like nitpicking every single thing that your body does, right? Like where your hands are, how your fingers are placed. Like if your knees are straight, if your toes are pointed, all these things, if your neck is like long enough, you're constantly scrutinizing yourself. So yeah, from the outside, I mean, it's a lot of... Um, always constantly trying to be better but actually that like really fueled me like always wanting to be better it was pressure like I was really hard on myself always growing up because I feel like my family just had this expectation it was never like if you don't do this you're not good enough but it's like we achieve high and like we go for the best and so with that like always looming in my life also being Asian right it's like stereotypes <laughs> if you're <laughs> if you get a B you're not an Asian you're a Bijan like you're a disgrace to the family I'm just kidding I've it wasn't actually that. like that <laughs> but it was like obviously I had these high expectations always even from just being who I was looking like who I was and so at times I was really hard on myself I just was um I was sad a lot of the time, but also at the same time, I loved getting better at something. And so I loved when I was in a class doing drills across the floor and my teachers would pick me out and say, hey, you need to straighten your legs. You need to, whatever, any correction that they gave me. I loved it because I was like, okay, I'm like, other things are good. And j there's just one thing, if I do this, then I'll just take it that, that much further. And they always say in dance too, the difference between an amateur and a professional is anybody can do the big things like kicks, leaps, or I don't know if this is dance or technique no, things, but the big moves, flips, tricks, people can do those, but it's the in-betweens and like the little nuances that make a difference in how will you score and who becomes like professional. And so thinking about that, I was like, okay, it's just the tiniest differences that make a difference. And if I can do those tiny things, like Anything that can put me ahead is going to help propel me towards my goal at the time, which was to be a cougarette. So that's kind of, that's, that was my mindset around dance. It was like, okay, it sucks that I get nitpicked all the time, but also like, I love it because I get better. Did you, yeah, yeah. It's just such a high expectation, right? Yeah. In your mind, you're like, I will be a cougarette. It was like, this is happening. Yeah, in my mind it was, my senior year especially. So I I did I was kind of like on the fence. I was like, can I do this? But then I was like, no, I'm gonna go for it. Like I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna dedicate my whole soul to this. And so I did. I had to give up a lot of time with my friends. Like I missed out on a lot of social opportunities, but it was because I was like, 
this is going to pay off in my future. I'm going to be a What would that rank. look like? Like to prepare for that, like time, how much time were you putting into that? Um, I was dancing like 20 to 25 hours a week and then like four to six weekends a season, we do these things called conventions where you go and you do classes for like six hours in the morning. You just learn from different professional choreographers. You do, you learn a dance and then you perform it like in the middle of the, the floor in groups at a time. So you have those classes and then you have a lunch break and then you start competition at night. So then you're doing all your dances that you rehearse for like the whole year. You compete against people and then you have awards after everything's done. So it's like three days from like 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. at night dancing. So that was like, that was crazy, but it was so fun for me. Like just having so much adrenaline, like being in another room, just trying to like be good at dance and yeah. competition really drives me. So like that too was really And how fun. would you rank in those competitions? Um, I did pretty well. There were some years that I didn't do as well, but it always drove me to want to do better. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my senior year, well, yeah, I mean, the first year I was on this team, I was kind of behind because I was at like, I was at this awesome studio that, but it was a lot more low key. And then once I got into this pre-professional program, I was like, wow, I have to up my game so much. And I remember at the first competition that we went to, um, you do, I did a solo. So I rehearsed like solo, a solo piece on my own. And then we had all our group dances. We had like 10 group dances that we did. And so for the solo comp, I placed and everyone on my team was younger than me. Like I was the oldest person on my team and everyone got a platinum. So it goes platinum, high gold, gold, high silver, silver. And so everyone got platinums and I was the only one on my team to get a high gold. And I was literally devastated because I was like, <laughs> like one, it was a shot to my pride, but also two, like, dang, I was just disappointed in myself because I'd seen how hard everybody else on the team worked. So it wasn't like, oh, that was undeserving. It was like, man, I need to end my game. So then that whole year, I worked super hard on my solo, just like rehearsed it after every practice that I could, ran it as much as I could, just took any feedback from any of my coaches that were willing to watch. And by the time finals rolled around, or um, what's called nationals, we were in New York, And I did my solo, I felt good. And when awards came, I got a platinum. So it was seriously the most rewarding thing ever at the time. And just knowing that I could, that I could work for something and see progress in myself was super empowering. So, I mean, I feel like that's something that dance has taught me a lot of is like, Okay, you don't get this one, you get the next one, you know. You just work harder, you try try harder, put more effort, more time, you'll get it the next time. And that's a powerful lesson, right? Mm -hmm. That you're capable of doing whatever. Yeah. Uh, but then you wanted to become a cougarette. Yeah. And tell me about that. What happened? So I was, oh, to go back to your question, that was such a long-winded answer. But to go back to your question, I wanted to be a cougarette so bad. So I was like, okay, I can do this. I'm going to work put in the extra hours. I did tons of um, private practices that whole year, went to the camps, did the thing, did all the things that I could. And I then, I felt ready. I was ready to go into that cougar at practice. I was confident in what I could do. There were four rounds. Each round you do a different dance, like a different style. So you start with technique. Someone get, people get cut. Then you do uh, like a contemporary lyrical, it's like slower dance. Um, combo, little like, I don't I'm know how to describe. so much about dance. I know, uh, sorry, I no, 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 all like great. dance terms. Yeah. But you learn a combo, you perform it, next people get cut. You do a hip hop combo, you, next people get cut, and then you're in an interview round. So I made it to the interview round. I was, there was nine people left, and- How old were, were you? I was 18. 18. So it was right after I graduated high school. Okay, and you're on the final round to be a BYU Cougarette. Yeah, there were nine spots left. Or And how many were, people apply? There were like, I don't know. Usually it, it starts with like 200. And, 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 and then just to apply, gets, you need to be very good. <laughs> well, anyway, you apply, right? So it doesn't really matter. But um, 
I got to the last round. There were nine spots or nine girls left and six spots on the team. So I was like, okay, my chances are pretty good. Do I think I'm going to show? I was like, I think I can do this. But then I got cut the last round and I was devastated. I seriously, like my world fell apart because I was like, oh my gosh, like this is, I've prepared, I've put in so much time and everything that I wanted didn't pay off. That's what I thought at the time. Um, but so many other good things happened in my life because of that, like rejection after that. So grateful for what happened now, but it sucked at the time for sure. Yeah, uh, because in moments like that, it's very easy to think, well, I invested all this time and effort for nothing. Totally. You, and you can say it like, you can see it like that, right? Mm -hmm. When when things don't work out, we things are very black and white. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's great or it's nothing, mm -hmm. right? And and I, 18 years old, uh, being so close to the everything, mm -hmm. it's, it's even more devastating. Yeah. What did you do? Uh, your 18 didn't work out. How, how did you deal with that? Who did you talk to? How, like, because it, it's a big thing. My friends literally came over to my house after and like brought me chips and guacamole and crumble and like, uh, what are they called? Soy cookies, because those are my favorite things. And they just like, I just cried to them for like an hour. And so I, I don't know, I really did just have to feel it. I was sad about it for a while, but also at the same time I was like, okay, well, I guess like I'm not gonna be on Cougarettes this next year. It's kind of a relief because now I can like let go of this thing that I like worked so hard for, but also it was like, it was also super tiring and very taxing <laughs> on my soul. I was like, now I can have fun. Like I can loosen up a little bit. I can do school. And then honestly, like the first thought when I was like in recovery mode was, okay, I'm supposed to go on a mission. But I was like, oh dang, I don't really want to go on a mission. But um, that thought just kind of took hold. And then as I just was thinking about it more and more, eventually I decided to go on a mission. Six months, my birthday's in December, so I could go right after the semester. And I, that is single-handedly the thing that has like spurred the rest of the good things in my life. And so I'm super grateful because I was like, this is my honest thoughts. <laughs> thoughts of an 18 year old kind of, I was like, oh, I'm gonna be a cougarette. And then I'll get to perform at all the games, like, and then I'll be able to date someone and I'll get married and then, and then my life will be great. And then that's it, you know, like I won't have to go on a mission and then that's like my excuse to not go. But I'm so grateful because I knew that if I did do, I, the, I literally said in my head to God, I said, if I don't make congrats, I'm gonna go on a mission in six months. But then I didn't make it and I was like, oh, I don't wanna go on a mission in six months, but then, Eventually it came to, I was like, no, like I want to do this for me. I want to do it for my life. And, and then I decided to go and it changed my life. So I'm super grateful. The people that I met, the timing, everything worked out perfectly. Isn't it interesting? And we've been talking a lot about how in the Western society we, we think. We think of the milestone and we think of the destination. And we're like, well... If I get here, then I will be happy. And and many times we those goals become become blinders mm -hmm. because that's all you see and and you commit to that and you think your happiness and your whole purpose of life is attached to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when things don't happen, or even when we get there, we realize that it's not even there. Yeah. But there's one part that that you got out of that that is even though you put all this effort for that destination, mm -hmm. that effort was not wasted. Totally. Because that max effort created patterns of behavior for you. Definitely. Uh, tell me about those things. Uh, how those patterns of learning this, and I don't want to call it perfectionism, but this dedication uh, and, and try to not leave anything up to chance because that's, dancing, right? You, mm -hmm. Nothing is left up to chance. Mm -hmm. How did those things uh, translate into your mission and then into sales and, and into the rest of your life? Yeah, well, I think with dance, it was just like, I decided I was going to do something and I wasn't going to quit ever. And so on my mission, I was like, I'm going in for 18 months. There's no chance I'm coming home. Like I'm going to 
do this and no matter what happens, I'm going to do it. Like, I'm going to do it the best that I can. And so that really helped on my mission because I just, like, I didn't ever look back. It wasn't ever like, oh, should I go home? It was like, no, you're here. You have hard times, but you're going to do this. Um, and then I feel like that that part of me just kept growing throughout my journey. So I was like, okay, well, I've done the hard things before. I've, like, faced rejection. Okay, now I'm on a mission in Japan, probably the least conducive place to people who want to hear about Jesus. And so um, I was, like, every day going out, doing my best to talk to people and and teach them about Jesus Christ, and it was just not catching. And so um, on my mission— I actually, by the end, I hadn't baptized anyone. And if you're like a member of the church, you know what that means. Like, you're like, what? Did you even, <laughs> did you even work? It's like probably the first thing that I was scared that people would think about me. But I was like, no, like I had to take that up with God at the end. I was like, God, I gave everything that I could. Like, is that, was this enough? And he was like, yes, Sister Shinsato, this is enough. Like you did your part, just keep working. It was like, I had two months left of my mission. So I was like, okay. Like, I feel peace with that. Like, I've done my part. I can keep going. And, like, no matter what the outcome is, I'm going to keep going. So, finished my mission. Still nothing. But I was so grateful for that because I, I was humbled. I went in there. I was like, I'm going to baptize this whole country. Like, this is going to be the best thing ever. And then it didn't happen. But at the same time, I know that I saw miracles. And I know that I grew so much. So, I was like, okay, I'm okay with that. After my mission. And to, to interrupt you a little bit, it yeah. uh, comes back to what you were talking about and on that first competition where you didn't make platinum, mm -hmm. your lesson there was, well, I just need to put more effort yeah. and things are going to work out the exactly. way that I want them. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like, yeah, if I'm not platinum, it's because I didn't put the effort. Yeah. If I put the effort, I'm going to be platinum. Exactly. But then the next two big lessons, you put all the effort <laughs> Saying, okay, uh, I just need to put the effort and I'm going to become a cougarette. Yeah. And that didn't work. Yeah. And then on the mission, I'm going to put the effort, I'm going to baptize. Yeah. And that didn't really work. Yeah. Uh, how, like, what did you learn from that? And that's what, what you're talking about, right? Uh, yeah. Well, I was like, I know that it's not, I mean, maybe it's me. I could definitely always try harder. But I know it's not like a product a problem with the thing that I'm talking about because I know that it works. I know that if somebody wanted to walk into the church today and say, like, I want to be baptized, that happens all the time. You hear that all the time. But I was like, if God wanted that to happen to me, it would have, but it didn't. So, like, obviously he has a different plan for me. So that's okay. I'm going to keep working. Like, I don't, I'm not dejected by the things that I'm teaching. It's just like, okay, that's what I needed to learn. And so I feel like that mindset carrying into the rest of my life is like, okay, well, I know that my efforts aren't going in vain. If I keep trying, something will happen eventually. Like, I can't just keep failing for the rest of my life if I try. And that wasn't the end of the failures. <laughs> You're like, those were two big failures. I'm like, no, no, no. no. It, like, to me, this is such a powerful message because that's what makes you different. And when we look at your success and, uh, and people that might not know you, like, in sales, you've killed it. You've made so much money. And it's very easy for people to think, oh, she's just talented. Right. But the message that you're bringing is like you are giving your 150 percent mm -hmm. uh, without really saying, OK, that 150 percent is going to equate to this mm -hmm. outcome. Yeah. It's, I'm giving 150 percent because that's what I need to do. And the outcome. We'll see what happens. Right. Uh, totally. And people get so disappointed when they don't get the outcome they want yeah. because they feel like they're entitled to what they think they they deserve. Totally. Right? Uh, and that is amazing about you. Yeah. I mean, in post that, I wanted to be a trip leader for HXP. So you're just hearing all my failures on this podcast. But uh, I mean, <laughs> if, it, if that made you become who you are, like that was totally worth it, right? Yeah. I mean, I, so I did HXP before my mission as a builder in Samoa. Because that's I wanted to go to where my dad was converted. I just want to see. Anyways, that changed my life. So I was like, I want to be a troop leader for other kids. I want to do that for other people. Tried out right after my mission. Didn't make it. Tried out the next year. Didn't make it. I had to try out three times before I made it. But I was like, I literally told the staff. I was like, 
I will try out until you let me be a trip leader. I will not stop. Literally tell me anything that I need to do to, to be a trip leader because this is like something that I want so bad. I will literally do anything for it. So they finally let me in the next year after that, which is awesome. And that also changed my life. But um, I don't know, just failure after failure. I just feel like with that determination, after proving to myself, like, if I want something enough and I, like, try hard enough and I throw it out into the world, like, it can happen. Granted, there's going to be feedback and, like, there's going to be things that I had to change about my life to be, well, to be able to be in the spot that I was in. But I was so grateful because that totally carried into sales. Like, okay, I've already been rejected. I failed at so many things that I've tried so hard at. And now, like, okay, I'll, doors, whatever. I knocked doors for 18 months. Didn't see anything, you know, but who cares? I'm going to keep going. Got a lead in the first, like, the first precinct that I went on. I was stoked out of my mind because I was like, oh, one person wants to listen to me. This is crazy. Um, so, yeah, I feel like all those things, all the failures have, like, really built me and just shown me, like, okay, it's not about the outcomes. It's about what happens post all your failures and you just it's like all those cle ch cheesy cliche things that they're like, it just matters how you get up, not about like what knocks you down, you know, how many times you get knocked down. It just matters how many times you get back up. So things like that like resonated in my head. And I just, I believe that one day it would happen because God wanted good things for me. Um, I remember there was a summer that you struggled when, when you did HXP. Uh, I remember you got back and you were struggling. You were not selling, uh, but you were working really, really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember we talked and we had a little pep talk where you're like, I don't know if I'm good at this. I lost all my magic. I just got lucky before <laughs> and, and, yeah. and all that. And, and, and you were working, trying so hard and nothing was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you uh, extended uh, for a month mm -hmm. or, or two. Mm -hmm. A month. A month. And... In that month, I mean, how many sales did you get? Um, I probably made like half my money the last month, like in extension, because I did. I, lo I lost momentum leaving in the middle of the summer. But coming back, I was like, okay, well, it's go time. Like I have to make this happen, and I only have one month to do it, so I'm going to do it. Yeah, and uh, I remember and that things like that are very defining of who you are, right? Because it's so easy to give up. And it wasn't all due to me. Like, I'd seen it happen multiple times in years before. Like, Christian, my cousin, he he was closing deals and things, but, like, didn't really see money until later in the summer where I watched him just, like, struggle and struggle and struggle. And then he finally, something just clicked, and, like, he just ran. And I was like, dang, if you can push through that, like, okay, I'm going to do the same. Also, Caden, um, Caden and I just watched do the same thing. He closed tons of deals. He closed the same amount of deals as I did. And he didn't make any money until August, like mid-August. And then he got like 17 deals in. He had three the whole summer until the end of the summer. And so I just see things like that. And I'm like, okay, well, if it can happen for them, it can happen for me. I just need to keep working and I need to figure something out because there's something that can change that I just haven't figured out yet. Yeah. But if I talk to enough people and like w read books, watch sales podcasts, listen to whatever, anything that I could to improve myself, then like there's something that I'm just doing wrong that if I just figure out, then I can, then I will see the same success that they see. Um, how do you deal with, uh, and you talked a little bit about that, but life is not always happy for Kenna, right? Uh, even people like you, you have moments where you question yourself and, and you're down and you cry and you, you, you go through all that. Uh, how do you deal with that? The sad times? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think I just rely on knowing what I've already done in the past. Because in high school, sophomore year, when I went to the new studio, I like went super hard. I also changed schools. I also moved, changed wards. Like I was in that same place for a long time. So it was a big change all at once. And I was like seriously depressed. I don't, I mean, not like clinically depressed, but I was super sad for a whole year. Like I cried every single day and I was like, I made it through that year and I was like, okay, like I did that. Now I can like reset and do it again. And just knowing that I'd done that once already and like multiple times before, like having all these rejections and whatever hard things in my life, um, 
I just knew I was like, or I know in myself that it's, it's never the end. Like my sadness is never the end point. There's always more. So I think that's what gets me through. And literally it's just the fact that like, I know that God will, God is on my side and God wants the best for me. He wants the best for me more than I want the best for me. And so he's going to, he's going to make it right in the end. If it's not the end, if it's not right, it's not the end. So it's okay. And like, I still have so much life to live. Like I, and I, I think I've learned this from sales too. Um, if I put in the effort, um, and if I just keep going, if I just keep knocking doors, eventually something works out. No matter if you, even if you have to knock 70 doors and don't get anything that day, but you knock 10 doors the next day, there's one person who's interested, you're like, okay, well, I'm glad I didn't stop after the 70 because I found one in the next day. Um, what made you come to Enlight and what did you love or still love about Enlight? Um, I've told this story a lot before, so I don't want to like make it redundant, but Christian, I haven't heard it, so. oh, really? okay, well, um, Christian just got back from his mission. Obviously, okay, Christian's my cousin for those of you who don't know, I think most people know who are listening to this, but we were best friends growing up. So huge influence on my life. But Christian got back from his mission. He was like, I'm going to sell pests. I was like, don't sell pests. Talk to my friend, Spencer Hart, who I've been friends with him since I was like five years old. So I was like, talk to my friend Spencer. He made 100K in a summer. He was like, blown, right? So I literally just connected them. I had no intention of ever selling, but we went to Top Golf and just hung out. And then Christian was asking Spencer all these questions in the car. He was telling us about PPAs and how they worked. And I was like, holy cow, I can totally do that. I was like, that's it? Like, you don't have to sell like this huge thing? He was like, yeah. A couple days later, Christian was like, I think I'm gonna sign up. I was like, mm, me too. So then I literally just, I signed up. I was also working at the MTC at the time. So I was making like 11 bucks an hour, working 12, 12 hours a week. Um, and in a semester, I made like, or in a year, in two semesters, I made like $3,500. And so I was like, I was literally dying. I was like, I don't know how I'm gonna buy food. My dad was helping me with rent, which I was grateful for. Um, and I was on scholarship, so that was nice, but like doing ex anything extra was so just out of the question because I was like, I don't have money. Um, and so I was like, I need to do something different if I want my life to be different. And so I was like, I knocked doors on my mission, I was fine. Like I came out resilient, I was happy, like I loved my mission, so I can do it again. So I just tried it. And then I was like, oh, I could totally do this. Like I said, on preseason, I got one lead and I was stoked. Um, so then luckily having Christian there with me like the whole time and also Spencer like being one of my best friends and then having tons of other, other friends on the same team from my high school that I just love so much, um, that helped me. I was like, okay, bare minimum, it's gonna be a fun summer with fun people that I love. Even if I, even if I make one sale, that'll be worth it for me. Hopefully I make more than that, but if I make one, I'll be grateful. Then I did my summer and I ended up being better than I thought I could be. You got a lot more than one. <laughs> you got more than one. And so that was like, that was a huge confidence booster to me because I didn't know if I could do it. I was really nervous actually, because I was like, oh, is this gonna be like my mission? We're gonna knock again and just not see anything. Like, I know that I can learn something from it, but I really hope I make money because I, hate living like this um because i was working going to school doing an internship trying to have friends at the same time <laughs> it was just not working and so i was super grateful for sales anyways that year gave me a lot of confidence that i could work at something and do it and then every year after that i was like can i do it again do, like i have to prove myself again that prove to myself that i can do this again and so the next year i was like okay let's do this again like even if i make the same amount of money great if i can make more awesome made way more money than I made the year before. And so every year after that, I mean, last year it was a harder market, but I was like, okay, it was a hard market, but I knew I was going into hard market because it was something new. So I was like, okay, I'll learn this year. This next coming year, as I go back into the same market as I was in last year, I'm excited because I'm like, okay, now it's, it's running time. Like it's gonna be like my second year in San Jose where I already, where I kind of figured it out the first year and then I was just able to improve everything the second year. So I just, I feel like it's gonna be like that. I'm really excited. So anyways, I'm just grateful for Enlight because I feel like Enlight's giving me a place where I 
can, I've been around, I've met so many people who are incredible. Sanjeev, you've been like a huge mentor to me. Seriously, like have also boosted my confidence. Like when I was, I did not believe in myself. You were always like, no, Kenny, you're special. You, you can do this. And I was like, I was always grateful for that. Um, you and so many other people here who just like believed that I could, even though I was, I doubted myself. Um, so that's one thing about Enlight that I love. Another thing is just like everybody is so um, similar minded. What's the word? Anyways, they think very similarly. Like I want to support myself. I want to make sure that I can build my future. I want to be a better person in like every aspect of my life. And seriously, meeting people like that, I've met my best friends and now I'm dating someone from Enlight, so um, who knows where that's gonna go, but it's awesome that I've just been able to surround myself with people who are incredible, and I feel like it's raised my vision for my life, for who I can be, and for um, just like what I can achieve, because I've seen people do it already, and um, that is just invaluable to me. So post-mission, I think Enlight has been one of my greatest blessings um, as far as pushing me to be who I am, and also inspiring me to continue to build myself and who I can be. And who do you want to be? What What's your big why? That's a great, for sales or for like life? For life, and I think sales is one way that can help you get there, but. Mm -hmm. Well, I just feel like the more that I have, the more I can give, and um, something that just like lights my soul on fire that just makes me so excited to live is doing good for others. So my senior year when I went on my trip to Samoa for HXP, that absolutely changed my life. Like I was so happy for two weeks. And it was kind of, it was after, after national, so I was pretty drained. I was just like tired. But this just like, it was still work. We were building a house and like a bathroom for this family who had 29 people living in a tiny house, maybe the size of like an average kitchen. But as we were doing all this work, I literally just, I remember stopping and thinking to myself, I am so happy. I feel so just like filled with purpose. And I was like, I need to be doing that for the rest of my life. Like I need to be involved in something where I feel like my soul is just like lit. And so um, I feel like sales has given me the runway to be able to do that because especially with like Gran Esperanza and us being able to donate and like seeing how we've been able to help those kids even like for an hour that we're with them or however long we're with them. That's been incredible. But also beyond that, because I've been able to become financially stable, I was able to do HXP for another year and I went to Ghana and I, um, I was a trip leader for like between 16 to 18 year olds. It was a group of 19 kids with another co. And just talking to the kids there, we built an IT center there for a local school. And we donated a bunch of computers at the end so that they could learn how to work a computer and also like get tutoring internationally, things like that. I remember just talking to a kid who was, um, on the work site, he worked with us a lot. Um, and we were like, what are your dreams? And he was like, well, I wanna be a singer. And like, he had a seriously a beautiful voice. And I remember talking to one of my builders, her name's Kate, right after. And she was like, she just started crying. Cause she's like, he wants to be a singer so bad, but he'll never have that opportunity because of like where he lives and where he grows up, where he grew up. And so, sorry, I'm like getting emotional. It's like so tender to my heart, but um, this kid, his name's Kobe. He, um, I just like saw so much in him and I was like, you have so much potential that is just gonna be untapped because of, you just don't have the opportunities that we do. And then I think to myself, I'm like, I live in America. I knock doors and I can make money. Like I can basically generate money out of like thin air essentially, like I don't have to have any college degree, I don't have to go to school, but I can like provide for myself. And 
all I have to do is knock doors. And for me, like, I was thinking, if Kobe had this opportunity, he would literally give anything. He would work his butt off so that he could achieve his dreams, but he just, he doesn't have that. And so I was like, I don't want to squander my opportunity. I never want to, like, be in this place where I know that God put me into a great family with great parents, um, great friends, and I didn't use it. I didn't reach my potential, and so I wasn't able to help the people that I needed to help. And so... Um, things like that drive me where I kn- I've seen like the deep poverty in Africa where we lived. We like you plug in a, a blow dryer and it short circuited the whole like apartment complex fuse. And so they barely have electricity. Their ACs didn't work half the time. We were living in like 95 degree weather and like 90% humidity. We were dying, but like that's how they live. And I'm just cushy, sitting on my couch here in Provo, complaining that I have to do homework so that I can get an education, so that I can make a lot more money, so that I can whatever, you know, do everything that, like, take advantage of all, I have so many opportunities that I was just, like, complaining about. So I was like, sales is just such a good place for me to push myself and to make the most of myself. And so the thing that drives me in life and what the end goal is, which I don't have like a specific, yeah, I want to do like this. 10, 10 years, 50, like Kenna at 40. What, what, is, what does that look like? I don't know. Hopefully I'm married. Hopefully I have a good, have kids and hopefully I'm a good mom. And um, I don't know, like I, like I said, I don't have a firm goal, but if I could, like there was a couple who built a, a college in Ghana. And so now because of them, they like donated this college, they give high level education for super cheap. So many of those people there are able to get an education because of those two people. So I was was like, okay, this college was probably billions of dollars to build, but like they literally just gave their money to build a college in some third world country, right? So I was like, if I can do something like that where I can build, have a big impact, which is because I made money, that would be incredible for me. So I'm like, and today Jimmy Rex on the call, he was like, you work, I can't remember what the exact quote was, but he said something along the lines of, you work so that you can build yourself so that people, so that you and your, in the future can like be reliant on yourself and so that people in the future who need you, you'll be ready for. So that, like that idea, seriously, like that is the driving force of like everything that I do because I have gone to a point where I'm like, oh, I can travel, I can do fun things, I can, you know, whatever. I can basically live my life however I want. I can be comfortable in everything that I have. But now I'm like, okay, what's the next thing? Okay, well, now I'm living for... Now I'm preparing for whatever comes my way, whatever big opportunity comes that I can take advantage of because of not only like the money that I made, but also the skills that I built, the communication, the friends, the connections that I have now. Like, what can I do to like better the world somehow in the future? I don't know. But I know that that journey, like it's been opened in the past, that with I know that everything that's led me here to where I am now, I didn't know what I was going to have a year ago, five years ago even. And I know that's going to be the pattern in the future where I don't know what the next thing is, but I know that when I see an opportunity, I'll be able to take it because I'll be ready. Hopefully. <laughs> well, sorry, I just talked rate, to you. <laughs> at this rate, I think you're definitely going there. Uh, thank you for, for sharing all of that. And I think, it, yeah, I think we can talk for hours and hours uh, to more stories about you and, and how I you, literally talked how you, <laughs> no, no, how you face life. And it's, uh, it's amazing. And, Again, even for a lot of women, uh, that they need to see this. They need to uh, to see a strong woman that, that <laughs> just goes for it. And and, it, and it's not that you're not scared because mm-hmm. there's a lot of things that are scary, but you face it and you believe in, 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 in yourself, mm-hmm. right? So to end this, my last question, what is your superpower? What do you love about yourself the most? Mm. I love that I can get along with almost anyone. I feel like I can make friends with like lots of different types of people. I love just hearing about people's lives and their stories and things like that. Like that gets me really excited, no matter who it is, like especially different people from me because I live in this world where a lot of people who do think the same (laughs) are like very similar. So that's awesome to get me to where I want to go. But also like I love hearing about other people's lives. And so I feel like that trait helps me a lot in life because I get to make more friends and connections and then we all help each other and it's all fun and happy and more full and exciting.